Thanks for everyone for joining us today as an online live event to learn. And I'm Jesse, the host from AI Camp. Before we get started, just want to do a quick introduction on AI Camp. We are a global online platform for developers, engineers, and data scientists to learn and practice AI technology. With the mission of make AI available to all developers, AI has grown to over 50,000 tech engineers in the group, have hosted over 300 local tech meetup, workshops, boot camps, large tech conference, and live, and live stream most of the tech talks globally. We have local study groups in the most major cities in the US, a few cities in the Europe, India, China, Australia. You can take a look at the website to see our upcoming tech talks, workshops, and a cash course that we offer. Here are webinar we have for the upcoming weeks. We have built your first AI chat workshop on the LRT. Most importantly, we will have our AI NextCom uh, boot camps training in LA and Seattle in next January. And we will have the, our AI NextCom Seattle conference from January 23 to 26. It will be four days, 50 plus tech leader speakers, 60 plus tech talks, six workshop, and presented by engineering team from Microsoft, Amazon, and Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn. And today, we are excited, we are so excited to have the Razor from Ohio University. In this talk, in this talk, we will see how game zero make nature work generally, and we will have to the simple interpreter we use Pytro. Before we get started, just want to tell you a little background about Risa. Risa is an experienced researcher with a demonstrated history of working in computational and observational astrophysics. Skilled in mathematical modeling, statistics, machine learning, deep learning, computational physics, and Python. Strong research professional with a master's degree focused on theoretical and mathematical physics from California State University, Fulton, and currently pursuing PhD in time dolom astronomy at Ohio University. Without further ado, let's welcome Risa. Hi, Risa, you can share your screen now. Oh, sure, definitely, just a moment. Okay, sure, take your time. And uh, desktop one, I think, would be the best to share. Okay, do you see my screen right now? Oh, yes, I can see your screen. Okay, hello, everybody, and I'm so happy that uh, to be here, and I'm glad that they invited me. <laughs> so today we are gonna talk about generative adversarial networks without, you know, um, Further ado, let's talk what they are and how we can implement them. But before getting to generative adversarial networks, we should understand how neural network works and can, can it be generative or not. So I'm sure most of you heard about neural networks, implemented it and used it, but there's this big question, can you use a neural network to gener generate new samples? And we will see there's a shortcoming in neural networks to do that. So in order to be able to use a neural network to generate a new sample, we need to go to look into the game theory ideas. So the next topic I'll talk about would be game theory, and I'm gonna give you a very simple, simple example called prisoner dilemma. And then from there, we'll talk about zero-sum games, mean max, maxi mean, and see how GANs are gonna use these game theory ideas to, you know, to generate new samples from your distribution or your training data set. And then we, I'm gonna show you one implementation that I have on uh, PyTorch. So let's talk about what is a neural network. So neural networks usually 
you have a bunch of parameters in your neural network and you're trying to tweak those parameters to match the underlying distribution. As you see in this GIF, in this animation, our cartoon, Peter is trying to just use the blinds and you know, tweak the parameters to match the Windows distribution. Basically, your neural network is trying to learn the underlying distribution. So the neural network can be used for classification, regression. In the case of classification, imagine you have CAD and dog images, and you, ju you just throw a bunch of maybe 60,000 of these images to your neural network, and you train it so it understands what's a cat and dog, and it will classify it for you. In the house, for example, in the regression case, you have this you know, house pricing. Uh, pricing. You have a bunch of features like the number of bedrooms or like uh, age and these things, and you use them to predict the price of the house. Somewhere inside your network, the network understands and there is a model of what is a cat or a dog. But imagine a human child. When you train a human child on what is a cat or a dog, you cannot ask him to paint it without teaching him. So basically, a neural network can understand what's a cat or dog, but it's not going to be able to generate a new cat and dog because you need to train it for that. So basically, it does not know how to generate a new cat or a new sample. Another sensible example, we see here some bell curve distributions. Imagine these three are your training data set. And you have a simple linear regression model. Basically, you want to fit a line to this thing. You give this training examples to your, uh, to your neural network, which in this case wants to just fit a line. So it will understand the best line would be this bell curve, your bell shape you know, curve here passing through the data by minimizing something called mean squared error. But when you ask it to generate new points, what's going to happen is it's going to generate points on this curve, which is you know, basically not uh, good because it's ex exactly on the curve, right? And if I give you this image versus these three, you're going to easily say, oh, this is, this is fake because it's not matching what's the distribution. A smart statistician would say, okay, now I'm going to ask my model to generate points in standard deviation of blah, blah, and blah, blah, being a bit mean and max, you give a number. But what happens is the network doesn't know which one to pick, right? So it's going to generate many, many possible points, but at the end of the day, it's going to again smooth it by the mean. So you're not going to get again a very accurate result. So let's give another, you know, more sensible example. So imagine you have a bunch of images for numbers from zero to nine, which is we're going to see today in the code. This is called MNIST dataset. And you give it to your network, and network starts you know, training. And after the training, you test it to see, to see how does it do. And you see it's misclassifying 1 and 7. You know, Fortunately, your network didn't work on 1 and 7 very well. So what you do, you repeat the whole training on all numbers again and again until you get a very good you know, classification accuracy. But when you teach it to humans, you don't go from 0 to 9 and, you know, like, if, you're, if the human child doesn't understand what's one and seven and guess it 50-50, you don't go and teach the kid from zero to nine again for a couple of times. You just focus on one and seven only. Or basically, a good teacher trains the student where, it is, where he's failing. And, but you cannot go forever on humans because they will get tired and quit. But in AI, as far as we know, there's no feeling yet, and it's not going to throw an image and saying, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. So you can train and train till you get yeah, very high accuracy. So basically what we learned up to here is we need a process that will make the network to output high possible errors. What do I mean by that? Meaning that this process is spotting the weaknesses and throws examples to your network on those weaknesses and forces the network to focus on that. So in this case, the network will resolve the weaknesses by learning where it is and you know, trying to exploit it using new uh, basically examples or samples. One example of this can be game playing AI. When you're playing against the bot or game playing AI, what happens, the game playing AI is trying to exploit your weaknesses, understand what weak spots you have, and then makes 
strategies to beat you using that. But if you, you, if you put a game playing AI against himself, what's gonna happen is this game playing AI is gonna exploit his own weaknesses and make strategies to beat himself. And in the next iteration, he will resolve those weaknesses and it will become stronger. And this will keep going till he's a very strong AI you know, competitor. One example is Alpha Zero. You know, if you heard about Alpha Go that beats the world champion in Go, after that, Google released Alpha Zero that actually won against Alpha Go 100 0. And it, it accomplished it only by playing versus himself 19.6 million self played games in only four hours. GAN, Generative Adversarial Network, kind of falls in this category because you have two networks basically competing each other. Now, let's go to game theory because that's where. We, our solution is in order to make our networks generative. In order to understand zero-sum games, let's imagine an imaginary scenario. It's, a, it's 2050 and you have uh, two completely rational robots called Al and Bill. This, uh, you see it's A and B for Al and Bill. And so they decide to go rob a bank and they got caught. What happens is, they, you know, the police officers put them in two different separated rooms without any way that they can communicate to each other. And the investigator goes in to the Al and says to Al and uh, explains him his options and says, Al, if you confess, you will have two options. If Bill confesses, if Bill confesses, uh, what happens is, if, if Bill confesses here, you're going to get five years and he's going to get five years. If Bill remains silent, however, you're gonna get zero year, but he's gonna get 20 years. But he says to Al, if you stay, you know, remain silent, what happens is if Bill confesses, you're gonna get 20 years, he's gonna get zero. But if you both remain silent, you're gonna get one year, he's gonna get one year. If as humans, we look at this, since we are more emotional, we will say, okay, this is the best way to go, one year, one year, right? But these are two extremely rational robots. So what happens is Al will think by himself, if I confess and Bill confesses, I'm going to get five years. But if he remains silent, I'm going to get zero years. So my worst case scenario is five, five. My best case scenario is zero. However, if I remain silent and Bill confesses, you know, my worst case scenario is 20 years, but if he remains silent, my, you know, my best case scenario is one year. In both cases, confessing is good for Al. And this is a symmetric problem. If you switch it, it's gonna be the same. So this place, when they both confess, is known as Nash equilibrium, which is the solution for a zero sum game in game theory. Now, why this global optimum is not good? Let's look at it. So what is the definition of a Nash equilibrium and a stable equilibrium in this situation? It is if you take actions of one of the players constant, the other player can do something to improve his situation. So in this case, Al and Bill, if imagine Al somehow found out that Bill is not going to you know, confess, he's going to remain silent, he immediately can, you know, confess and get out. So the same happens in the other squares, we're not gonna go through, but if you look at this Nash equilibrium, this point which is called Nash equilibrium, if Al knows Bill is confessing, no matter what he does, he cannot improve his situation. This is called a Nash equilibrium, which is the solution to zero sum games. The next thing we wanna talk about is Minimax theorem. Imagine you have two players, A and B. Player A wants to maximize his minimum gain, meaning he wants to get as much as he can in the worst case scenario, without knowing the actions of player B. But player B wants to force player A to minimize his maximized you know, gain. Basically, you wanna make sure, you, you wanna make the game hell for A, so A cannot get very much money from you. In order to make this very easy to understand, imagine the same Al and Bill served for five years in the prison, they came out, and now they decided they wanna right, you know, gamble, but this time legally. So they have two strategies. Now let's look at it from Al's point of view. He wants to maximize his minimum gain. 
He says, if I play one and B, Bill plays one, I'm going to gain 20. If I play one and Bill plays two, I'm going to get zero. What is the minimum of zero and 20? Zero. Remember that. Now, Al says, if I play two and B plays one, I'm going to gain 25. And if I play two and Bill plays two, I'm going to get 10. So what's the minimum of 10 and 25? You immediately, sorry, the maximum of uh, zero, uh, the minimum of 25 and 10 is going to be 10. Now from action one, A knows the minimum he's going to get is zero. And from action two, the minimum he knows he's going to get is 10. So what's the maximum of these two? It's 10. So he's going to choose to play two. On the other side, Bill says, okay, I want to make life hell for A. I want to make sure he's going to get the least amount of gain. In the, in the worst case scenario for me. So he says, if I play one and A plays one, I'm gonna get 20. If I play one and A plays two, I'm gonna get 25. And if I play two and A plays one, I'm gonna get zero. And if I play two and A plays two, I'm gonna get 10. You look at it, he's gonna look at the minimums. You see 20 minimum is here, you know, so sorry, the maximums, it's 25. And the maximum here is 10. So he's going to choose to play two in order to make sure that the A is not going to gain too much money, right? So this is called, this action 2-2 two, two is going to be called Nash equilibrium. And this is the solution to mean max. Now let's look at again, a generative adversarial network. So this algorithm at first glance looks very complicated. But if you look to go through it, this is just again, Alan Bill in two different names generator and discriminator. So the generator function here called G and discriminator is called B. The job of the discriminator is to understand what is the fake image and you know, what is the real image. So when he sees a fake image, it's, it's going to just output zero. And when it sees a, a real image, it's going to output one. So uh, you will have a bunch of samples, which we call Z here. These are basically your noise. You can choose it to be Gaussian. And then you have a bunch of real samples, real images. In our case, it's going to be MNIST data set. So the generator will take this noise and try to generate images. But the discriminator's job is to understand, OK, this image is coming in. It's going to get half real images and half fake images. Say, OK, this is fake. This is real. So if you look at this function here, this discriminator wants to maximize this. Why it wants to maximize this, let's look at it more in details. Because if it gets real images, it's gonna put one here. And it's, if it, is, it gets uh, fake images, it wants to put zero in order to maximize this equation. But if you look at it to the generator, the generator actually wants to fool the discriminator, meaning that it wants to make sure that when the discriminator sees the fake images, it's gonna output one as well. So this one is going to be minimized because he wants to make sure that this DGZ is going to be closer to one. Basically, generator and discriminator here are two networks that are fighting or competing over the error function of the discriminator. If this doesn't make sense, I have a better example. So imagine in this scenario, this imagine uh, this story that you have a forger that wants, in our case, this is Jim Carrey, who wants to make fake money or fake dollar bills. And in our investigation office, we have a corrupted investigator, in this case, Sherlock Holmes. And basically the forger, the first time he gets, the gener he gets an input of this shape, which is a two dimensional Gaussian, imagine. And then he's, for the first iteration, imagine he's, drunk or whatever, he, don't, he doesn't know how to do it. He just prints out this thing on the paper bills and 50 paper bills goes out. So the investigator office or the investigation office sees 50 real original bills and 50 fake bills. Then Sherlock immediately understands this is what, you know, bad and they can understand this is fake. So he sends an email to Jim Carrey and says, okay, this is how we understood that these images are fake. Try to use it and improve it. 
What do I mean by that? He just sends this gradient, basically this information to Jim Carrey and says, now we were increasing the probability, you try to decrease it based on the information I gave you in the cost function. This will go on and on, basically every time the generator understands what, you know, what did, did he do wrong that the discriminator understood this is fake. So they will go on and on. Just remember that the discriminator, when it sees a real image, the Sherlock Holmes office here, puts one out, but then it sees the fake image, it puts zero out. If this, this game goes on, on and on, you're gonna have basically a forging god who's gonna make the best uh, dollar bills. And when the dollar bills goes, goes to the investigator's office, the investigator office is gonna input, you know, output 0.5 meaning that 50%, 50%, you'll have questions, it looks like. Okay, no. So basically, at the end of the day, you get to the Nash equilibrium. What's the Nash equilibrium here? The Nash equilibrium here is when the investigator or discriminator will output 0 0.5. That means no matter what happens, he doesn't understand if this is fake or real. That is where your GAN is working really well. So before continuing forward, I would like to take some questions if you have up to here, because I want to give some more uh, information about how to write the, how to write basically this network. Let me check if you have any questions. Okay, basically I don't see questions. So when you write your neural network, you can't just do a linear, transformation or use a linear function because usually data is very nonlinear your structures in order to understand the nonlinear distribution or structure of your data sets you use something called activation function which is usually nonlinear and these days okay looks like you have a question Nice question, Subash, it's a good one, that if you can use it to generate fake text. I saw one paper that somebody was working on it. I think it can be possible because it's not that, you, I'll, I'll explain it at the end, you can have just two networks competing to each other, right? So one of them understands what's the, uh, you have spam, non-spam, and you have another network that tries to make spam, for example, emails or spam text. That way, you're trying to basically fool your discriminator this way. I, uh, if you didn't get your answer at the end of the talk again, I will you know, go more in deep on that and send you a paper or something. So up to here, now we learned that this, we need a nonlinear function. You have a bunch of choices, which is called ReLU, leaky ReLU, tangent, hyperbolic, and sigmoid. I have quotes here if you want to see it it's just why do we use relu that's the question most of the networks you open you you have relu in them because it's computationally very less expensive you see that it's just the maximum between x and zero it reduces the likelihood of the vanishing gradients meaning that imagine if you have you know get very small numbers and when you go to very high layers, the multiplication of the gradients of this function, this, this nonlinear function, is going to become smaller and smaller, and you will get close to zero, and basically they will vanish. One more research article was published that saying it increases the sparsity. I still didn't study it too well to say like if it is good or bad, but I think it is because I tried it and it works better. And one more thing. Okay, so when you have a bunch of, okay, questions, it looks like. What are the hyperparameters? Okay, the, uh, the, that, questions will be an, that question will be answered when I go through the code. Because I'm gonna show you the code and you will see what are the hyperparameters that you can uh, train, okay? And so, this is called caviar initialization method. There's usually, okay, when you are starting your neural network, you want to initialize your weights to be close to zero. So basically, it's, zeros have been used. You can use Gaussian, but caviar initialization method is a newer way of initializing, which is much more robust. 
because it chooses the weights to be not too small or not too large. So you will not have gradient explosion or vanishing. And in order to train your neural network here, let me go back, one thing I want to show. In order to train your neural network or update your weights, you definitely need an uh, optimizing algorithm. For that, you're going to use something called ADAM, Adaptive Moment Estimation, which basically it's like a cruise system. If you go too fast, it will slow you down toward the global minimum. And if you go too slow, it will you know, speed you up. You don't need to write this algorithm down these days because it's already in PyTorch, TensorFlow, anything you use, you can just call Adam. Now, you have questions, it looks like. No, it's the chat, sorry, Q and answer. Okay, so now let's go to the code. If you have any questions up to now before I go to code, I would glad to answer about I would be glad to answer if you have any questions about the foundation of the GAN or anything that you didn't understand what's what's GAN doing. But if you don't have any questions, we will go through the code and you will see that it's not that hard to write a GAN to work. No questions? Okay, so Let's go uh, to the. Hey, Raza, I think there are two questions in the QA sections. Oh, okay. I answered one, and I answered uh, the the first one. I answered the second one. I said I will answer the second one when I go to the oh. code. Oh, okay, good, good. Thank you. You're welcome. So let's open the code that I have here. I hope you see the code. Let me just maximize it. Okay, so basically, now I used PyTorch. You can use anything else you want. You can use TensorFlow, any other, uh, I don't know, there are other ones that, you know, you can just use Keras, that's much faster, but I like PyTorch. Before going through the code, I suggest everyone here who is starting to learn deep learning, PyTorch is very, very friendly because it's like num NumPy in, it's very familiar environment. You will not get lost too much. So first, as always, I call it Housekey. I will share the link at the end with Bill so he can share with all of you how, where you can find the code. The code is on GitHub. So some housekeeping. In Torch, this is PyTorch. I'm importing PyTorch. From PyTorch, I'm importing something called Optim because Optim is you know, containing all the optimizing algorithms you need. Then this torch.nn is contains all those functions like relu, sigmoid, tan h, so you don't need to implement it. This functional, however, contains your loss function. You need a loss function. Okay, I have a bunch of questions, not one. Doesn't open for some reason. <laughs> Make it smaller, see why. Okay, my question. Stuck. <laughs> I don't know why I would. Okay, I, if anybody knows why this question I'm hitting on it doesn't open, please let me know. Okay, I will go back to that because it doesn't work right now. So, okay, here in the functional, we have the loss function. I'm importing the NumPy because that is just, uh, uh, I'm gonna use it in the future, but usually NumPy is always used. The other thing is matplotlib because you wanna show the images and what is the, when the GAN, the fake images versus real images. And this Torch Vision, when you install Torch, it's gonna come with Torch Vision. There's one line installation. This Torch Vision contains the data, data sets that you can use to train or practice with. So, Let's go and see how we get the data sets in. I'm just gonna, okay, this, I'm sorry guys, I don't know why my question, when I click on it, doesn't open. It's some technical problem, I don't know what's going on. Okay, I can't. I have to go back at the end, see what's going on. So, just to let it run, because, okay. Now, in this, Part. So 
we have a stochastic mini batch gradient descent training, meaning that instead of going one by one on images, we will go bunch at a time. So our mini batch number I chose to be 64. And uh, here in PyTorch, there's one very nice thing that you can do. You can just define something called transform and compose your own transform. In this case, I just want to transform everything to tensor because PyTorch doesn't understand uh, NumPy arrays. You have to make sure it's a tensor, a PyTorch tensor. But you can add other stuff as well. For example, you can make sure that this uh, transform that to tensor also, you know, uh, makes a min max, basically divides, uh, normalizes your data set. You can choose what kind of normalization you want to do. Here, I'm just downloading the data set from internet, basically. It downloads it from the internet. So I say, take the MNIST data set, download it, only training because we're not going to do any testing because GAN is not, you don't do classification with GAN. You're just making fake images. And transform equal transform means, okay, transform it. And here, this is just, this just reads your data set, okay? You want to make sure you have a loader because you want to load your data during the training. In this place, in Torch Utils uh, Utilities, you have something called data loader. You give your train set, which we defined it up here. You ask it to shuffle. During the training, usually it's good to shuffle. In this case, you're not doing classification. It's not going to add too much into it. But when you shuffle, you make sure it's a bit randomized. And your mini batch size is going to be 64, as we defined up there. So let's do it. Let's see. OK, the data is loaded. Now, just. In the case of visualization, we want to visualize. There's one thing that I want to talk about here. It's very important if you're going to use PyTorch. It's very good on that. So, you know, in, uh, in Python, we have an iterator function called iter. So train loader is an iterator. You can just iterate through it. So I'm going to define a data iterator here. And in order to get images and labels, I just say data eater dot next means get the next batch for me. This is just for visualization, okay? And I'm just testing and stuff. You know, you don't need to worry too much here. What am I doing in this part of it? But one thing you, you want to uh, also put is the dimension of those uh, vectors or basically those prior distribution you want to give to your network. So I just call it 100. You can make it 1,000, 2,000. We will see where we use it. And OK, here, the x dimension is going to be 720, 84, sorry, 28 times 28. You can put it by hand. I'll ch talk about it down there. But you can put it by hand, or you can just let me run this thing so you can show what does what do I do. So you see that here, this print that test size. I'm just taking some test images, right? And you see it's 64 of 784, right? How did I do that? Because it's not 64, 784. It's usually 28 by 28 and 1. In order to do that, you take the first image that size 0. You say, okay, take the 64 and then do a minus 1, meaning that just flatten it. This is called matrix flattening. If you use TensorFlow, you, I'm sure you have done it. Now, here in this imshow function, you can just make a grid. You don't need to do anything else. You can say, okay, Torch Vision, take these images, make a grid for me. This is the grid it makes. And then you want to transform them to NumPy right now. In order to transform a tensor to NumPy, you just say dot NumPy. It's not that hard. You just say dot numpy does it for you. And then you want to just, you know, you want to make a figure. These are like very simple Pythonic things. But in order to show the image, you want to make sure it's going to be 1 to 0 when you reshape it. Because first, we are, you know, when you transform it to numpy, it's going to reshape it to a 28 by 28, 64, 28, 28, 1. You want to make sure it gets the image 28, 28, 1, not 1, 28, 28, because it's going to get confused. So that is where 1, 2, 0 come, comes in. Let me show you if you don't, uh, uh, if you're lost on this thing, I can say images dot size to see what is this when you give it in. 
And you see it's a 64, 128, 28 thing, right? Uh, let's say tensor here. So when you give it in, it's gonna just use this part for each image to plot. But the thing is the im show is gonna fail if you don't say it's 28, 28, 1. So you just use transpose to transpose your matrix. And now, as I explained, we are gonna have initialization or weight initialization. So I said we will have Javier in it. Here I just, you know, what I did, I said for each linear layer you see for each of the you know, neurons, use a Javier unit uniform, which is already implemented, you don't need to implement, and take the weight and initialize it. For the bias, however, make zero. So if you used pandas before, you know what I mean, you can just use the dot apply function, we will see that. Now for generator here, this is the whole network I defined. I didn't want to go too heavy like convolutional neural networks or whatever, you know, because the thing is you just want to learn. So you better learn with a one layer, one layer of neural networks. So I just defined one linear layer for my generator, one linear layer for my discriminator. Now let's look at how do you do that. So this is basically a subclass, not a class, if you know what's up in object-oriented programming. This nn.module is coming from PyTorch. This is going to be your mother class, right? And here I'm making a sequential model. Basically, this nn.sequential will help you to just do everything in once. You don't need to write so many things. Like if you don't do that, it's going to be five, six lines separately. But when you do this, you just say, okay, take the z dim. My z dimension is just 100. You can do 1,000, 2,000, doesn't matter. This is, your, this is, your, this is going to be your input, right? Then give it to hidden dimension, which I think I defined up here somewhere. If I didn't, I will define it right now. Um, just in order to be sure, I'll just define it up here. To be 128, it doesn't matter too much. So now you have a dimension of HDIM to be 128, and it's gonna give it from this layer, to basically output layer, which is gonna be uh, 784, 28 by 28. That's your X dimension we defined up there. And this sigmoid function will make sure it's gonna stay between zero and one, and ReLU is basically your nonlinear activation function for this layer, the first layer, your hidden layer. Now, after I define the model, you can just say self.model.apply. Uh, you have questions. I'm Sorry, guys, I don't know why I can't open this thing. If anybody knows from uh, Mika, Bill, this thing doesn't open. Oh, it's okay, Reza. You can just finish like your speech, then we can jump to the Q&A section. So you don't okay. have to De at this time. Definitely. Sure, yeah. thank you. No really problem. Mm -hmm. So when you use this dot model dot apply, which is basically here, you're calling your model and say apply this init weight, this function over all of my weights, right? And then here in PyTorch, when you write it in a class form, you want to make sure you have a forward function defined that just takes the input and then outputs the model. This is for forward. And discriminator is exactly the same, but the difference is you get the images, the size is 784, give it to 128, and then you give it out as zero, between zero and one, either zero or between zero and one and one. And you do the same thing. So let's run these two. Run. Okay. Now here I'm gonna, you know, to put two instances, one for generator, and one for discriminator, G and D. But in order to continue working on training side, we need to have two solvers. I told you you're gonna use Adam here, right? So you're just gonna say optim.adam. If you see up here, this optim contains Adam in, in, in itself. You don't need to write it down. So you just say Adam g.parameters. You're gonna say, okay, take the parameters of G, learning rate. I hope I defined it up here. It's fine if I, didn't I just will define it? <laughs> it's quick. LR equal one e minus three. 
just put it up there always everything so you don't need to so this uh, G solver and D solver are gonna be your solvers with the learning rate of one E minus three. Why do you choose one, one E minus three? Because it's the same thing. If you have very high uh, value for learning rate, like 0 0.1, it's not gonna converge at all. It's just gonna bounce dance around, you know, around the, in, in the minimum. It's not gonna hit the minimum. And when you choose too small, it's gonna take forever to converge. One E minus three is, I found it good. It works very well. Now you can actually also work to see which learning rate is better. This can be a hyperparameter to train. That's what I heard from one person. And now here I'm just going to go for two epochs, you know, just to see if it works, right? Let's see how it works in two epochs. Now this is called the training for loop when in PyTorch and in TensorFlow also you do that. In the training for loop, I just put a G loss run for getting the loss, loss value for G and the loss value for D to be zero. And then I say for I and data, I enumerate in train loader. You remember up here, I defined the train loader. Uh, let me show you where, here, this train loader, right? So this train loader, you're just gonna, you know, make a for loop that goes through this, right? And Every time you come in, you will have X, which is your images, and your labels. We don't need labels because we're not doing classification. So the mini batch size, every time take, uh, take a note of it or save it somewhere, every for loop you come in. One reason behind that, because if you have perfect 640 images, then it's fine, divisible by 64. But if you have more than that, something like, 645, your last batch size is gonna be five. So you better understand it, know it before going forward. And then X, that X view, basically you wanna get that 784, I told you up there. And one labels and zero labels. Why one labels and zero labels? Because we will have real images and fake images. We wanna make sure that discriminator will output one when it's real and output zero when it is fake. We'll see how we're gonna use this thing. I'm just trying to use torch that ones and torch that zeros to make in the size of my batch size, between the number of images I have, ones and zeros. Now, before going forward, I told you that we were gonna have some prior distribution with a dimension. That prior distribution can be a Gaussian. I'm just using a random normal distribution from torch. MB size is the image size. Z dim is the dimension of the input you want it to be. I told 100, you can make it 2,000, 3,000, whatever you want. That doesn't matter too much, okay? And here I say, okay, G sample, meaning this is my noise. I'm giving it to my generator. So generator is gonna output fake images, right? And then D fake, I'm gonna feed in the discriminator, this, this fake images, and we have more questions. I'll come back to that. Sorry, guys, I can't open this up. I don't know why. So this G sample, you give it to the discriminator, it's gonna put out output some number. At the beginning, we don't, you know, it can be any number at the first training loop. And then you give it D real, basically DX, you know, you, you just feed in your discriminator with your real images. And now you're gonna define your discriminator's loss function. This is very important. You can just use binary cross entropy and say, okay, the output from the defake, push it towards zero, right? You just wanna make sure your network will output zero when it is fake. That means any number at the first loop it's putting out or outputting, you wanna make sure that is gonna go towards zero. And the real part is gonna say, okay, take the real images and push it toward once, the outputs to be one, right? And now this is gonna be the whole loss function, real and fake. In PyTorch, simply you just call your solver for discriminator, which we defined up here, and say, okay, make the gradient zero when you come in. Every time you make the gradient zero to start fresh, you fist feed forward, you zero the gradient, and then now you move backward, take a gradient basically, chain rule gradient or graph gradient. 
and you just take the step. Now let's go to generator. The discriminator wants to push fakes towards zero and reals towards one. But the discriminator, the, sorry, the generator, I'm just copy pasting these two lines again. There's not that much of like difference. So we again generate some new samples just to show you that this doesn't remember these things because it can be like, then you can say the network is cheating, right? If it remembers those. So these are fresh here. And then we feed this new uh, fake images to our discriminator called defake. In our generator loss, however, we want to push the defakes towards one. So you see, this is the part basically the uh, competition starts, right? This one. This one wants to push the defakes output to be close to zeros, but this one is pushing it to one. Basically, they are competing over this part of the Oh, we have 10 questions. I'll come back to that, guys. I'm sorry at the end. And then so we, you just, just definitely, again, just go, okay, you know, uh, zero the gradients for G solver this time, go backward, and then, you know, uh, take the step. This part is just, I'm printing the loss functions after every epoch, and I'm just plotting you some, you know, fake images which uh, one thing you should be uh, careful about when you do that, when you're trying to get the output from the, one of the networks at the end of each epoch, try to detach. Because if you don't detach, it will screw your network. In the new version, it should be detached. You can't do it anywhere else. So let me increase this to 20, or let's say 10 in our case, which is gonna be slow. And let it run. And because the, why it's slow, because I'm basically doing a video call right now. So I apologize if it is very slow because it's using a lot of, okay. You see the first epoch, you see it's just picking out on O's, like nothing, kind of zeros, right? Just a normal distribution. There's some issue here because I'm using the video call, it makes it slow. Let it run. And you see it's the last function does not correct. I will check that on later. That, it's fine. The, the code on the GitHub works. So if you see this doesn't print correctly, you can just download the code from the GitHub. It should work. And you see this is just, again, picking up on some features. Yes, it's picking up at nine, you see. Because just we are using one layer of neural network, you shouldn't imagine it's going to get a perfect, very beautiful nine or eight or five or two, but it does the trick. So if you want to get better ones, you can just switch it to convolutional neural networks. You see clearly it's getting some nines here, right? It's understanding now what is nine. So it's trying to fake nine. And it's pretty slow because I'm using video call. <laughs> And still, you see it's continuing. So you have a bunch of eights coming up. If you just make them smaller, they will look much better. I just enlarged it for you to see. And the resolution is not that good. So if I make it smaller, it looks really good. And OK, so if, yeah, you see ones, nines, eights, it's just picking up on this. I think. Well, how many minutes did I speak? I don't know, but I think it's kind of 50 minutes. So I can stop this from running right now, but I will continue, let it run. If you have questions, we should go back to questions right now. But I don't know why I can't open this question folder. Hello. <laughs> I think maybe you have to close your uh, browser in order to see the questions. Maybe. Okay, definitely. Yeah. I'll do that. Let's see. Yeah, I think if you make it smaller, you can pull up. The question. Still, that question doesn't come up. Don't know why. Okay. It's still not working? No, I don't know why it's not working. I can stop sharing for a while and see what happens. Okay, yeah. I reshare, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that will help. Maybe it just like froze for some reason, probably. Yeah, it is frozen. Yeah, <laughs> definitely.
if you can read the or you can give them voice because there are not too many questions if uh, you can. yeah there's like 11 questions on there do you mm. want me to read off the questions to you maybe well yeah the first i uh maybe the yeah for sure the first question i answered let's go from the second question okay so I, uh someone asked can this can be used to trade to train fake and original text as well apart from the image i think you answer part of the question right yes you can do that just go to archive and search for it there are a bunch of papers trying to do that or in github so basically here you see that okay let me go so you have the gan and a discriminated uh, the generator and a discriminator you see in the case of the generator i'm just using a normal linear layer you can, what you can do, you can just use a recursive neural networks or a sequence sequence AI bot in both generator and discriminator. So in that case, then you're gonna make sure that one bot understands what's the fake text, what's the real text, the other one tries to fake the text. It's exactly the same thing. It shouldn't be, uh, theoretically it's possible, but I haven't done it so I can say, okay, you know, it works like that or not. Okay, and so the next question is, which other uh, algorithm can item be used in GAN? Uh, sorry, again, I couldn't hear. Uh, so which other algorithms can item be used in GAN? Oh, which other algorithms can be used in GAN? Yeah. So basically, GAN, you can use anything here, okay? Any machine learning algorithm and deep learning algorithm can go here. There's no issue on that, okay? Based on what you want to do. But more often, they use they use on images. They use because GAN is mainly does image work. So you know this convolutional neural network comes here, and convolutional neural neural network comes here. But it's not limited to the uh, to your. Definitely, it's not limited to what kind of algorithm you want to use. You just change it here. It's not that different. Any this can be okay if if the question is answered. If not, I will answer more in detail. Okay, and then the next question is, any link for the PyTorch tutorials for beginners? Oh, you just uh, for PyTorch, uh, you could just go to PyTorch's website and open their tutorial, which is one of the best ever written, in my opinion, and you will learn very quickly. Like, you know, just go through the tutorials of PyTorch from the beginning and go slowly down. That, I mean, it has everything in its own website. Okay, and also, what other hyperparameters of GAN that, that can be contributed to is coverage? In, in convergence, okay. Yeah, convergence. So, the thing is, uh, that is a tricky question because the thing is, you're not doing classification here and you don't understand how accurate your GAN is. Okay, that's the thing. When you do normal neural network or classification, you can say, okay, my accuracy is 95%. 98%, 99%. But when you do GAN, basically you want to fool human eyes, right? So if you can fool human eye, if you can just look at the images and get fooled, basically, that's what I would say, you can say, oh, good, that is a good image that I did increase. In, in the case of hyperparameters, uh, one hyperparameter can be the depth of your network, how deep you want to go. You know, you can also play with those. The other thing I would say for the GAN, okay, one thing is now outside, you can do super resolution. You can take your very, very bad images and try to make it really good, uh, increase the resolution. This is called super resolution that can be done kind of with GAN as well. And you can have your image and measure your signal to noise ratio. That, that is one thing I, I think can help you if you can understand if the signal noise ratio is increasing or you have a better signal. I hope I can I answer that question. Okay, okay, thank you. And here's the next one. How does the training data set will inference the results or generate the image? It definitely uh, influences it, right? Because uh, you see here, we are just training over the numbers, right? And this is just a gray image, meaning that you have one color code. But if you train it on colored images, it's gonna change because your distribution is changing, you will have different distribution and definitely changes the, uh, the result of the network because the network is trying to fake the input images, right? So if you give cat images, it's not gonna 
output dog image. It's gonna try to uh, give you fake cat images. So I can, you know, use that phrase. Okay, and here's the next one. So will this code run under PyTorch 1.0? Yes, definitely. It can run on PyTorch. I'm using PyTorch uh, point, uh, 0 0.41 because this is more stable version, but you can just uh, run it on 1.0. It doesn't matter. No issue. Okay, and here's the next one. So are there any examples of people applying transfer learning to GANs? Transfer learning to GANs. I haven't seen that, but uh, basically I know that GANs are used to generate uh, artwork but I haven't seen that they use transfer learning for that. I should check into it. Thank you actually for a good comment. But um, basically recently they generated a painting that sold for half a million dollar. Based, GAN based. <laughs> okay, so here's another one. So what other challenging research tracks in GAN? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand. Uh, what are the challenging research uh, tracks in GAN? Oh, you mean what other challenging questions uses GAN? Yeah, I think okay, that's so, the same. I mean, GANs basically can be used for a lot of stuff. But one, more imp one very important thing that GAN does, other algorithms don't do well, is imagine you have a set of images or any data distribution based on you know, your images. You want to understand the underlying distribution of your data set. Again, when while faking it, it's understanding what's the underlying distribution. So you can use that to understand what's the underlying distribution. And also one thing about GAN research, if you want to do more research on GAN, there are already 340 something GANs out, different implementations like info GAN, C GAN, name it. But none of them will you know, do better than the original GAN based on the paper. So don't waste your time going to different kind of GANs. Just use the original GAN and try to use different networks in it. OK, let's see. So how do you implement in PyTorch for branched networks? Branched networks? Yeah. I. That question needs to be more clear. I don't know. I, let's go back, get back to that question. I think you should be able to just, you know, search on Python. I, but that's what I do. <laughs> I don't know the answer for that. Okay. And then, so how is data augmentation in CNN different from GAN? Data augmentation. Ah, okay. So I didn't do any data augmentation. Okay, what is data, the data augmentation means, basically, the meaning is you take your data, you flip it, you rotate it in order to increase the viewpoints to your data, okay? So GAN is basically nothing in the sort of computer vision, right? GAN is using CNNs. So whatever data augmentation you do for CNNs, you can do for GANs. There is no, not, nothing to stop you for that. Because I told you, when you read the original Ion Goodfellow paper, it's using CNNs here, convolutional neural networks, not you know, a, fee, a fee, normal feed-forward neural network, which is I'm using because I have a MacBook Air, so I didn't want to run a very heavy network. So data augmentation can be used basically. Whatever you use for CNN, you can use for GAN. No issue for that. OK, so is GAN really understanding or trying to find the best fit? Uh, basically, I told you, GAN is trying to find the, not best fit, what is the underlying distribution of the data set. That's the, yeah, kind of, you can't say it's best fit, but there is no way to measure that. So basically, you're trying to fake your network, right? By faking, I mean make an image that your discriminator doesn't understand between the real one and the, the, the fake one that generator uh, generated. So in this case, you can say kind of it's trying to understand the underlying distribution, but it is not exactly fitting in the idea of saying I'm fitting a data set because fitting, you can have measure called root mean squared error. You can say, okay, my RMS is low, but GAN doesn't have those privileges. Okay, and I think we only have time to take one more question. Someone asked, uh, so where can they get the GitHub link? Are you, will you provide it to us? Yeah, I will. I can send it to you, Mika, and you can share it somewhere. I don't know yes. where to share that. Yes, I can okay. send it to their emails. That's fine. You can just share it to me. Definitely, I'll do that.
So I think that's all the questions we can take for today. There's like still plenty we haven't got time to answer. So you guys can just like um, email Reza or just uh, like connect with him on LinkedIn and stuff if you have more. Yeah, yeah definitely. They can email me. I mean, they can uh, send me messages on LinkedIn. I will answer. No issues. Okay. Thank you, Reza.